Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for this regular press briefing regarding coronavirus disease, COVID-19. Uh, today, uh, we will uh, have our Director General, Dr. Tedros, calling us from Kinshasa. Before we uh, give a floor to Dr. Tedros, I will just uh, say what I say most of the days, that uh, journalists who are watching us uh, using uh, Zoom, uh, please click raise hand if you want to ask questions. Those who are dialing in by phone, star nine, and then asking questions. Dr. Tedros will be on the screen that is on the side in this room. So people uh, who, are, who are watching online will be able to see Dr. Tedros. Uh, those who are watching us on Twitter may not be able to, uh, to see Dr. Tedros, but everyone will be able to hear him. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of uh, WHO Health Emergency Program, Dr. Oliver Morgan, Director of Health Emergency Information and Risk Assessment, and Dr. Sylvie Brion, Director of Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness. I will now uh, try to get in touch with uh, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros. Uh, if you can hear us, uh, please, uh, you can make your can remarks. remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of uh, the Congo, as um, Tariq said, where I have met with President Tshisekedi, uh, ministers, UN colleagues, and other partners to review the impressive progress that has been made towards ending the Ebola outbreak and to talk about future plans to ensure that everyone in the DRC can access quality health services going forward. And attention, focus on strengthening in the country's health system and bolstering preparedness. Whether it's Ebola or COVID-19, investing in preparedness is the smartest way to ensure these outbreaks are identified and stopped quickly. I'm glad to say that countries around the world are in a better state of preparedness for COVID-19 than they were just a week ago. And WHO's efforts to help countries boost their lab capacity continue. Now, the latest numbers on the COVID-19 outbreak. As you know, China has changed the way it reports data from Hubei province. Uh, there are now a total of 47,500 laboratory confirmed cases in China and 16,427 cases that have been clinically confirmed in Hubei province, making it more than 63,000 in total. While it's not uncommon in outbreaks for case definitions to change over time, as more information becomes available, we're seeking further clarity on how clinical diagnosis is being made to ensure other respiratory illnesses, including influenza, are not getting mixed into the COVID-19 data. In total, there have been 1,381 deaths in China, including 100 reported today. Outside China, there have been 505 cases in 24 countries and two deaths. China has also released data on infections among health workers, which stands at 1,716 reported cases and six deaths. This is critical piece of information because health workers are the glue that holds the health system and outbreak response together. But we need to know more about this figure, including the time period and circumstances in which the health workers became sick. WHO guidelines have been developed for health workers taking care of hospital, hospitalized adults and pediatric patients with acute infections. These guidelines have been made available to all countries. As I said the other day, we have been in regular contact with suppliers asking them to prioritize production and distribution of personal protective equipment
to health workers on the front lines. We are also in touch with member states on this important issue. I'm glad to say that the WHO-led joint mission with China on COVID-19 is moving forward. We expect the full team to touch down over the weekend. The mission consists of 12 international and WHO experts and a similar number of national expert counterparts from China. The China mission will include in-depth workshops, a data review with the principal ministries, a series of meetings with key national level institutions, and field visits in three provinces to understand the application and impact of response activities at provincial and country levels, including urban and rural settings. The goal of the joint mission is to rapidly inform the next steps in the COVID-19 response and preparedness activities in China and globally. Particular attention will be paid to understanding the transmission of the virus, the severity of disease, and the impact of ongoing response measures. Furthermore, it will be important to review which type of information is needed so that the world can use this window of opportunity to prepare health systems and workers for possible outbreaks. Clearly, this is an evolving picture. Health workers and responders in China are working with virtually no sleep in difficult conditions. But we need to ensure that we're getting the most accurate data as quickly as possible to assist China and support the global response. We're working with our Chinese counterparts on these issues, and this is also part of the scope of work for the WHO-led joint mission with China. Finally, I wish to thank Cambodia, especially uh, the Prime Minister, for demonstrating to the world the meaning of solidarity. While other countries turned away the Western Dam cruise ship, Cambodia allowed it to dock. Today, Hundreds of passengers are disembarking and are en route to their home countries. 20 passengers who reported signs of illness have tested negative for the coronavirus, COVID-19. I hope that other countries will follow Cambodia's lead. Lastly, I want to say again from my heart that this is the time for solidarity, not stigma. There are worrying signs that the world is not hearing the call for unity and standing in unison with those at the epicenter in China who are saving lives and alleviating suffering. I again repeat, this is time for solidarity, not stigma. This is time for solidarity, not stigma. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you very Dr. Much. Tedros. Um, Dr. Tedros is calling uh, from Kinshasa, so therefore the, 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 the sound was not the perfect, but we were able to hear everything and to get the messages from Director General. Uh, those calling through phone, it's star nine. Those who are on, uh, on Zoom. Yes? If I may say. Please. Uh, as you know, I will be taking my flight shortly, so I may not be to, with you until the end, but you're in able hands with my colleagues, so I hope you will allow me when I am ready to, to leave uh, the room to catch my uh, flight. Thank you. Of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, so, uh, star nine for those dialing in by phone and uh, clicking raise hand on those on Zoom. We will start obviously here in the room as we do every day. Here we go. One, two, three, and then we will go online. Yes, please. So um, a commentary published lately by the Lancet said that many of the travel restrictions lately implemented by some countries during uh, the uh, COVID-19 outbreak violates the international health regu uh, regulations, which is the uh, 
legally uh, binding system for protecting people mm-hmm. worldwide from the uh, global spread of disease. So I just that uh, Dr. Uh, Ryan, what's your uh, comments on that? Uh, can those restrictions be considered as violation of international law? Thank you. So, Dr. Tedros, if you feel it at any moment that you would like to answer, please just uh, jump in. Uh, Dr. Ryan, maybe you want to take this one. Okay. Um, uh, yes, WHO has been clear on its advice to our member states regarding travel and, and uh, advice to travelers and travel and, and trade restrictions. Um, it's important to remember, though, that the temporary recommendations issued by the Director General under the IHR are actually not binding under international law. What's binding is that countries shall provide a public health rationale for the use of those measures where countries exceed them. So it's a very, I know it's a pedantic point, but it's very important to, to, to make it. Uh, we try to set a, a general uh, guidance that allows countries to act in, in good faith with that guidance in place. Countries may act to exceed that guidance as long as they are able to justify that in public health and make a rational, a public health rationale for having taken those measures. Uh, In the end, sovereign countries are responsible for the health and welfare of their citizens. And as such, they make risk assessments for their citizens and apply measures that they perceive that protect their citizens. Uh, And as such, they are once they are within their own legal national framework, uh, then the, the, the IHR is silent on that. The issue is whether or not uh, they are in a position to share with us the justification for that. And that's what we've been doing, is following up with each and every country and asking them to provide us with the public health rationale. Why have you done this? What was the evidence for this? How long will these measures be put in place? Will these measures stop or prevent people traveling uh, in, in, a free, in a free manner? And that, that's our job and that's what we've been doing. Well, Dr. Tedros, if he wants, he will, he will uh, uh, add something. Uh, and if not, uh, uh, Christian, uh, Gunilla, and then Jamie, and then we will go online. Can you please, uh, Can you please uh, there's, a little, there's a little button. Okay, thank you. I have a very fast two-part question. Can you enlighten us on the 12 uh, international members of the... Um, team that is going and how long is this team going to stay in place? Is it going to Wuhan? And the second question is, was there any advice on, uh, to Japan on the Olympic Games? Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to mention that we would really, really appreciate to have one question per journalist. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I can start with the second question and the, the, the Director General may, ask, may wish to input on the, uh, on the international team. Uh, we are constantly in touch with the organizers of major events. In fact, we have long-term collaborations and have had in the past with major mass gathering organizers. We work every single year with the authorities that organize major religious festivals like the Hajj. We've had teams working for almost every Olympics and World Cup in in the last uh, two decades in terms of risk management. So we are uh, very much engaged with with, with those institutions and with those uh, with those events Um, and and we will and obviously offer them any support and technical advice as to their own risk assessment and risk management regarding COVID-19. Uh, at this stage, there has been no specific uh, discussion or no specific decision made regarding uh, um, any of those mass events in the, in the coming months. And, uh, but we stand ready to offer both uh, member states hosting events and uh, organizations organizing events to offer them the best mechanism and risk assessment uh, um, approaches that we have. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Dr. Tedros would like to... Uh answer the question on international team. So the uh, first question was not clear. The second question, I will start from the second and you will tell me the first. For how long they will stay it depends on, you know, um, the scope of work they will, they will have there. 
so they will adjust based on the need uh, for them to stay. But I'm not clear about the second question. I'm in the first. Opposition. So, uh, uh, Cristiano is asking if we can give more details on the composition of the team. Ah, the composition of the team, it's um, experts from uh, different uh, countries who are really good in, their, uh, in the area of expertise which is needed. Uh, and uh, for now, uh, we prefer to keep it uh, as such, uh, but we will give you more uh, information about the experts um, whenever it's necessary. Thank you very much. Tedros, uh, Gunilla, and then Jamie, please, one question. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Gunilla von Hell, Swedish, Svenska Dagbladet. <clears throat> I have a question on the medical uh, workers, 1,716. Do you consider this uh, figure credible? Uh, are you worried it's actually more? And how worried does it make you feel, especially now when you have more people coming to hospital as they have enlarged the definition? And if I may add to that, the ones who get ill, infected, and then recover, do they have immunity for life? Um, I'll start on this question, but I will hand over to, to Sylvie, who has maybe some important messages to help workers around the world on the implications of these data. Uh, the, the fact that there are over 1,700 cases amongst all of the, the cases of, of uh, COVID is, is very sad news. But we've seen this before with MERS. We've seen this before in SARS. We've certainly seen it with hemorrhagic fevers. Um, and uh, what we need to be able to do within that and what we are doing with Chinese authorities is exploring the time period over which those occur. Our understanding is that the cases amongst health workers peaked in the third and fourth week of January and there's been a rapid fall off in the number of cases that have occurred in, in health workers in the last two weeks. This may reflect uh, increased levels of training, increased levels of protection and also increased levels of awareness. Uh, remember, this outbreak has come, expanded very quickly in a, an unsuspecting health system. So we also need to look at how many of those health workers were exposed unknowingly within a clinical environment, you know, and, uh, how many were wearing protective equipment, how many had training. There's a whole load of factors we need to look at. Um, and we will be doing that with Chinese authorities. But if you look at the percentage of the overall number of cases, in fact, uh, although it is still very, it's a very tragic situation for those health workers and particularly those who've lost their lives and uh, we, we, our heart goes out to their families uh, for, the, for their courage. Um, it is a lower percentage than has occurred in, in other um, uh, coronavirus outbreaks. Now that's not a guarantee that it won't change and, and clearly, but what is clear is that we've always known that health workers are in the front line. We've said in many, many occasions here that the real front line and the real point of entry for a virus into a country is a busy emergency room, an unsuspecting uh, general practice clinic. So we have called again and again for the training and equipment of, uh, of, uh, of, of workers. The Director General has called for a prioritization of protective gear for those workers uh, because we understand those risks. Uh, and again, uh, we do believe that it's, uh, it is possible to manage patients with the coronaviruses very safely with the proper training and the proper uh, protective equipment and we need to send a reassuring message out there and Sylvie has much experience with this and she may be able to give more context for the messages we need to send to our health workers because they are our front line, they are our heroes uh, and we need to be very careful in how we message around this issue of infection. Thank you, Mike. And indeed, um, so we had this data and now we are really uh, discussing with Chinese authorities to understand uh, what has happened. Uh, although it's not unexpected or unusual because we have seen this in previous outbreaks, but it's very important to understand um, if it uh, has happened at, in the emergency ward or if it has happened when they were treating patients or somewhere else uh, within the hospital facilities so that we can also uh, target uh, and target uh, implementation of corrective measures. Uh, what also is very common in epidemics, especially when people are, are working 24-7 and they are under a lot of pressure, is the fatigue of the staff, 
and uh, probably the peak coincides with a time where people were already exhausted and maybe they have not been as attentive as they should have been on infection prevention and control measures because they were too tired. Uh, but we have learned that uh, Chinese authorities have sent uh, uh, a number of uh, do other doctors from other provinces to uh, uh, continue to support hospitals in, in Wuhan and help uh, uh, the health workforce. Uh, but we know that, as Mike uh, said, is that uh, health workers are always at the front line. Uh, they are the first one to see uh, the uh, index case, the patient, and so uh, they need to get uh, prepared. Uh, so we have um, first developed a training package for them, and you will uh, find it on OpenWHO, our massive online open course platform. And uh, we are also uh, having uh, dialogues with uh, uh, more than 40 international medical and nursing uh, uh, associations uh, to uh, make sure that um, the advice and recommendation uh, reach uh, most of the healthcare workers. And, um, and so uh, we are, it's, it's a process, ongoing process, and we have a teleconference next week uh, to discuss with those people. Yeah, we don't. We, we don't, obviously it's too early to tell what the immunity profile will be. We, we we really don't. We don't have a serology test even to test for immunoglobulin response yet. So it's going to take time, uh, and it's impossible to know. But we we would expect that recovered patients uh, would be uh, would be uh, protected from uh, having another infection. But for how long that protection lasts, or whether that protection covers other coronaviruses is impossible to say at this point. That's a, an item for immediate research. Yeah. But again, important to recognize when we say recover patients and when patients are discharged from, from hospital, they, they're, they're, they're swabbed before discharge, many are tested negative, and it's really important that we don't uh, start um, uh, creating stigma around discharged patients. When patients are discharged from hospital, they are considered to be fully recovered and as should be, such should be welcomed back into their communities with open arms. They're, they're survivors uh, and uh, they should be seen and welcomed and celebrated as such. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tedros has, uh, has left the, his office uh, in Kinshasa, so um, we will continue with our speakers here. Uh, Jamie, and then we will go to journalists online. Can you hear me? Can you hear the microphone? Okay. Hi, yeah, Jamie, Associate of Press. I'm sorry, I just wanted to follow up really quickly on Christiana's question about the Olympics because that is a major concern. And I just, the Tokyo authorities said apparently that you guys had told them that there's no reason to call it off, but there's a lot of people in China that are afraid that they may not be able to fully participate. But that's not my actual question. My question is, could you please respond to what was said by Lawrence Kudlow um, about um, China, as much as you said many nice things about how China is responding, um, there was criticism from Larry Kudlow at the White House saying that uh, China is not being transparent and they're disappointed that the United States has not been invited in. So what do you say to that? Thank you. All the easy questions, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, we have not offered uh, uh, advice uh, to the, uh, the IOC for the Olympics one way or the other, and neither would we. It is not the role of WHO to call off or not call off any event. It is the role of WHO to offer technical advice to support a considered multi-layered risk assessment around the event, to offer advice on risk reduction and risk mitigation measures, to offer advice on risk response measures, and it is the decision of hosting countries and the organizing agencies to make that decision. So let me be clear, and we are continuing to do that. Um, will continue to do so for each and every event that is of interest. We are a member state organization. We are there to support our member states and support our partners at large internationally in that endeavor. So I don't know Mr. Kudlow, uh, but um, uh, the question is about uh, access for response within China. Yeah. Well, transparency about access for the team, Jamie, or transparency oh, yeah. with... Yeah. Well, it's it, it, opinions and speculation. We we've been very clear on 
on, on the fact that we've had a team on the ground as it, our WHO office has been there since the very beginning. Our, our country representative and a team were in Wuhan weeks and weeks and weeks ago. So from our perspective, uh, we have a, a, a government that's cooperating with us, that's inviting in international experts, that has uh, shared uh, sequences with the world, uh, that continues to engage with the outside community, that has published again and again and again in, in, uh, in credible international medical journals, that continues continues to make international presentations. So um, I'm finding it hard to square that with, with, with uh, Mr. Kudlow's comments, but everyone is entitled to their opinion. Um, and everyone is entitled to suggest evidence for, for their opinion. Uh, and, and, and if there is a clear, uh, any clear indication of, of, of why there may be some determination of lack of transparency, we'll be very glad uh, to, 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 to have that discussion. Um, with regard to the international team, I believe we will have U.S. experts uh, on that team. So uh, uh, we will have to, uh, to wait and see. So uh, let, let's see what the, the next few days and weeks bring. I think the other uh, thing to reflect upon is that there has been a deep scientific collaboration between institutions in the United States and around the world uh, with institutions in China uh, over the last, uh, increasingly over the last 20 years. It's really interesting to me that the, 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 the major scientific coordination organization in China is called the China CDC. Uh, I wonder where they got that idea. So, uh, you know, I think uh, people are, uh, need to recognize that scientists collaborate regardless. They get on with it and they've been collaborating, are collaborating and will continue to collaborate. This is a very obviously a tense political environment because of the, the economic issues and because of everything else. Please, let our scientists get on. Let our public health professionals let get on. Let them work together uh, and we find answers to this. And as the DG said, maybe we should try, all of us, to avoid politicizing this situation right now. Thank you very much. Let's try to get a uh, few questions from journalists uh, calling uh, in. Uh, uh, do we have a New York Times online? Yes, hi. This is Ronnie Rabin from the New York Times. I know you are, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I know you are still trying to get more information about how the healthcare workers were infected and, and, and uh, what the circumstances were, but are you, will you consider uh, uh, upping your recommendations in terms of the, the, the PPE they should be wearing um, and, adhering, and, and adhering to the CDC guidelines, which call for uh, respirators, not surgical masks? And that's just one question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Do you take one? Well, I think, uh, again, I mean, um, the PPE is one element of protection, but uh, more importantly is how you use the PPE. And, uh, and we have seen in many occasions for very dangerous pathogens that even with the uh, uh, highest uh, level of PPE, you can still get infected because um, of... Um, inattention and, and, uh, and uh, mistakes you do when you are tired or, or when, uh, when you are um, not being very careful on how you handle this. And we have seen this in uh, Ebola outbreaks. Uh, some healthcare workers, even with the PPE, were uh, still uh, got infected. So I think uh, the discussion is, is, is uh, more on uh, how can we make sure that uh, healthcare workers um, uh, feel safe uh, and also how they, uh, we ensure that they use uh, properly the PPE they have uh, and, uh, and um, when they are uh, doing specific um, um, procedures uh, where uh, maybe a respirator is, is necessary uh, that they can have access to it, but when it's not necessary, and there are many uh, times when you take care of patients where it's not necessary to have uh, such uh, equipment, uh, then uh, they just need to use what they have uh, the best way possible. And sometimes we have seen as well that having um, um, a PPE that is uh, very uh, sophisticated can give a false sense of security and then people forget even the most basic things such as wash your hands when you are finished. And I think that's why it's very important to uh, not uh, disentangle the, the equipment from the people uh, because these are protections, these are shields that uh, need to be used at the best and, and not uh, rely only on, on the equipment. 
Yes, and just to follow that and, and to maybe use the analogy, equipment and safety equipment is very important. But if I were to hand any of you scuba equipment and ask you to jump in the sea right now, you might be very nervous. Uh, the equipment is not what makes you safe. It's the equipment in the hands of a trained professional. Uh, and we need to focus on training and behavior just as much as equipment. Thank you very much. Um, I know that we have Nina here in a room, but someone from AFP is online, so let's try to get that one. Uh. Hello? 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 Uh, hi, it's Dario Thuburn from AFP. Hi, um, Dario. Doc, Dr. Ryan, uh, you, you told us about the the, the things that, that China's got right in the, in the response to this virus. I was just wondering, do you think there have been any mistakes at any level in China in the response? And do you think there are lessons we can draw about future public health emergencies? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there will be lots of lessons. Uh, we're doing that right now in, 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 in DR Congo. We just completed a peer-to-peer -peer review of our performance there and the performance of other agencies. Uh, but, and the time for that uh, is not now. But there, there isn't a single emergency that I've been involved with that we haven't uh, learned something from, and China and the rest of the world will learn many lessons from this. Oh, at least will learn and I hope implement the lessons of, of this. One of the tragedies of global response and, and public health response in general has been uh, the fact that we don't tend to learn the lessons of, from response, or at least we don't tend to implement the lessons that we've learned. Um, so, no, but I won't go into, I mean, yeah. You, you lot have been telling us about all the things you think are wrong with the response, so maybe you should answer that question. Uh, uh, but uh, no, I won't go into the, the details. It is not the time for us to start public recrimination. Uh, everyone needs to focus on their performance now, uh, and they need to focus on getting the job done. And the last thing you tell to someone that needs to get a job done is that uh, you didn't do your job last week or the week before. That doesn't support performance. What supports performance is getting people to internalize how they can improve and get on and do it. So we will have that discussion and we will learn the lessons and we are constantly in touch with our colleagues in China and the other countries. Uh, but uh, we, we will wait for any, uh, any forensic investigation of this response until we have achieved uh, further success in containing this virus, we hope. Hello, let's take, uh, we have a question from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, can you hear us and can you introduce yourself? Sorry, we don't always have names, uh, have names uh, uh, available. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, can you please introduce yourself and ask one question? Okay, this is Marian Benitez from Hong Kong Standard newspaper. I'd, I'd like to ask you, the Hong Kong Chief Executive, Harry Lam this afternoon said they are planning for logistics and preparing quarantine facilities to evacuate some 2,200 Hong Kong people out of Hubei province from 30 cities and about 200 more on Princess Diamond ship of Yokohama. So would the WHO, based on evacuation by other countries of their own nationals, would have some protocols for Hong Kong to make this a safe procedure and also how to communicate to the society because they are up in arms now for the delayed full closure of border points between Hong Kong and the mainland. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, we weren't uh, aware of, uh, I'm certainly not aware of that move, but I'm sure that uh, uh, as we always do with uh, China and China Special Administrative Regions, uh, we will always be ready to provide public health uh, assistance and advice for any public health intervention or measure that needs to be carried out. But we haven't received any uh, request to be part of or to offer advice. And it was very hard to hear the details, but I, I was hearing that you were referring to some evacuation of people from Hong Kong 
uh, from Hubei. Uh, so uh, we will, as I said, on, on, on request, be able to offer advice on, on, on how to uh, on how to do that in a in a in a in a in, a, in an appropriate manner. Uh, but in general, uh, we uh, um, need to be very careful when when doing uh, those kinds of processes because uh, we have to balance the public health benefit uh, against the issues that around quarantine about placing people together uh, some of whom might be infected and those who may not be infected and we we have to be very very careful in how we manage quarantine both scientifically and from an ethical and a human rights perspective so it's a, it's a, it's an important issue and it's one that needs to be addressed but it's also one that needs to be done sensitively and decisions to to make uh, mass evacuation and mass quarantine need to be taken with the best possible public health evidence and with the highest standards of uh, human rights uh, at its centre. Thank you. We'll go back to the room. We'll take uh, three more questions. Our speakers are leaving one by one. So, uh, yes, please. Not doing your job today, <laughs> Hello, uh, I am uh, Rinto from Nikkei, Japanese media. Um, my question is about Diamond Princess. Um, Today, the disembarkation of the passengers and Diamond Princess have begun, and although there are still many people on the board. But some experts or countries uh, criticize that the risk of infection has been increased within ship because getting off a ship was too late. How do you assess about this embarkation at this timing? Thank you. You know, it's very difficult from this distance to judge public health activities taken at a port in Yokohama. The authorities in, in, in Japan are experienced and, and they've been obviously looking at that situation over a number of days and weeks and they've made their public health risk assessments and judgments uh, based on that. Where, where we've been asked, we've, been, we've offered public health advice around patient cohorting, around uh, disinfection, around surveillance, around testing uh, and we've certainly asked uh, that uh, older older people on the ship and people with high vulnerability uh, might be uh, allowed to disembark under special conditions and especially people in inner cabins who don't have natural ventilation and this is really based on health and welfare of people not necessarily of that so we need to balance the health and welfare of the people on that ship and, that's, and they are from many nationalities against the obvious need to prevent any further spread within the Japanese community and I think the, the Japanese authorities I hope will find the right balance between those two things um, and uh, we trust through our discussions with them that they are beginning to see that uh, we have to make some arrangements uh, especially to take care of the more vulnerable people uh, on that ship, uh, especially those who don't have access to appropriate ventilation, etc. Two more questions, please. Uh, one from the back. Nawaz <coughs> Shah, uh, could you please elaborate on the uh, elaborate and uh, on the objectives and the content of the database WHO has developed to collect the latest scientific fun findings and knowledge on the coronavirus. The situation report yesterday. Yeah. So um, we we are providing um, a platform, data platform, so that countries, uh, especially on the clinical uh, uh, data from patients, so uh, we need to have a place, a safe place first to uh, have data that are anonymized, uh, but also uh, we need also to make sure that uh, people putting the data are doing it in a way that is standardized because currently we have uh, some cases in different countries and we need to be able to compare those data. So having a unique platform will enable us to uh, have rapidly more data than if, if each country develop its own uh, uh, data platform and then we share. And to give you an example, during the 2009 pandemic, uh, uh, we had similar uh, system, but uh, we didn't uh, pay too much attention on the way uh, the data were collected. And at the end, we couldn't compare many uh, 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 clinical forms because, for instance, the definition of hypertension was not the same in all countries. So this time we are trying to have really a standardized way to collect information so that we can rapidly compare and go to our results. And we will take the last question, please. Okay. Here you go. Yes. 
Thomas Blair from Bloomberg News. From Bloomberg News. Uh, I was just wondering if you have seen any signals that smoking might play a role in in determining the severity of the reaction to the disease, and could this be an explanation for why it seems to be affecting predominantly older people, and there's a bias towards towards men in China? I think if you look at uh, any uh, infectious lower respiratory pathogen tends to obviously affect people in their older age and, and certainly uh, those with uh, chronic, obstructive, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are at very high risk of negative con consequences of uh, viral uh, infection and particularly secondary bacterial pneumonia and other, and other things. So uh, it goes without saying that smoking is a risk factor for, for severity of any lower respiratory tract infection and we would expect it to be no different here. There is a marked difference between male and females in this, uh, uh, in this outbreak in terms of severity and there's certainly a marked difference in, uh, in those habits in China and it does demark along male and female lines and it's an excellent hypothesis but one that is unproven but I'm sure through the studies and the observations and the, that are happening there will be uh, a lot of interest to, to look at uh, that uh, smoking as a, as a risk factor and I think it should be relatively straightforward to, to establish the science on that Sylvie, what do you think? Yeah, I think so as well. I, I'm sure they have uh, collected those information, but analysis has not been yet published uh, on, on this factor uh, because most of the underlying conditions that are reported are also linked to uh, a disease associated with smoking as well. So it's very hard to uh, separate the two currently. So I hope that in the near future we'll have more information on that as well. Thank you very much. We will conclude uh, with this. Um, Uh, off the top of my head, Jamie, really. Uh, no, but we can, uh, we can pull them out uh, in terms of proportions, yes. Uh, we, can, we can do that uh, later. Uh, again, so we would thank our speakers, and then uh, we will have audio file and transcript for future media conferences. We will inform you in the morning. Just one thing for journalists who are online, uh, we had a little issue with uh, some people not receiving our media notifications. We are looking into changing the system. In the meantime, we have a place on our website where we will be posting media advisories and we will send that link uh, when, we send media, uh, when we send audio files tonight. Thanks to everyone and have a nice evening.